Breaking bread today, thinking about Galatians chapter 1, where Paul talks about his personal relationship with Jesus. And that's what we're here for, isn't it? To focus upon the bread and the wine, the symbol of his body, his blood, that he gave for me. He's going to say in chapter 2, that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And this is what we're here to do, to focus upon that personal relationship with him. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you asking for your help to open our eyes to Galatians chapter 1 and the arguments that you have inspired here so that we might be confirmed and strengthened in our knowing of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we may draw closer to you and to your dear Son personally. Please, Father, help us in our relationships with others, that we might find our security first and foremost in our relationship with you and with Jesus. And from that unassailable position, we pray for your strength to go out and be something helpful and somebody helpful to others, to your glory and the glory of the Lord Jesus. So help us to focus then upon him. And we pray for all your children, wherever they might be, who are struggling in that relationship with Jesus because they appear to be swamped by whatever is going on in their lives, by the hard words of others, by the rejection of others, by the unkindness of others, by the persecution of others, by practical daily issues that have loomed so large in their lives. Be it financial crisis, be it loss of employment, be it loss of relationships, we pray, Heavenly Father, that for each and every one of us, you will give us that knowledge of your Son, that relationship with him, that enables us to smile at the storm and to look confidently ahead to that wonderful day when faith shall be turned to sight and at last we shall eat and drink with him again at his table in his kingdom. For Jesus' sake. Well, Paul's writing here in Galatians 1 to people whom he had converted in Galatia, who were now slipping away, both from him personally and slipping away to Judaism, going to join the synagogues. Some of the people he baptised were Jews who were going back to the synagogue system. Others were Gentiles who were going away from him and from the gospel to that synagogue system, to Judaism. And they were critical of him because they were saying, who are you anyway, Paul? You came and preached your ideas to us, and yeah, sure, we were persuaded by you for a bit, but who are you anyway? They expected somebody to, to somehow have some authorization, to have some qualification. And he, as they saw it, was a nobody who had been chucked out of Judaism and was just a nobody, just a, a free thinker, just an individual, and they said, we don't want anything to do with somebody like that. We want someone who's got solid qualification. Who has authorized you to preach, to baptize, etc.? And his answer is, you're dead right. I have no human qualification nor authorization from anybody, but I do have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it is that personal relationship that is totally independent of what men think that I want to focus upon. But first of all, I want to ask, why would Gentile converts in the first century, of whom there were many in Galatia, why would they want to go to Judaism? Well, it actually makes perfect sense when you think about it. They'd encountered the message of the one true God and of Jesus, etc., and the wonderful idea of salvation by grace, that if you believe, he is willing to give you eternity in his kingdom because you believe. And all your sin is dealt with by his grace. He counts you as if you're righteous. Wow. If that is true, that requires everything from me. Sure, it is by pure grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. But if that is so, that I, a dysfunctional little individual on this earth, a sinner, has been saved, has been grabbed by God and his son, and I'm going to live forever. 
world. And that's certain. That hope is certain and sure. That absolutely this is so. Yeah, the Greek word elp is hope. It doesn't mean hope for the best. It means an absolute certainty. Whoa, that, that good news of the gospel changes me. It has to. Everything in me, whole heart, soul, strength, body, mind, becomes devoted to that reality. And the idea of just stepping back a bit from that is actually very attractive to say, yeah, sure, there's a God, uh, but look, we don't know if we're going to be saved or not. Uh, we are sinners, right? Yes. Um, just do a few rituals, and, you know, you're doing what God wants, and, well, you may be saved, maybe not. But let's do the rituals, and, uh, you know, you're doing your bit. Salvation, grace, well, don't worry too much about those things. Point is, you are submitting to the will of God by doing a few rituals here and there, and offering a sacrifice, paying a bit of money, doing this, doing that, and then you might be saved, who knows, we don't know, we're all hopeless sinners anyway, let's hope for the best. The important thing is to just get on with your life and, uh, you know. Well, that is actually more attractive than the radical message that the love of God is poured out towards you in the Lord's death on the cross and you will definitely be saved. Whoa. But we all want to step back a bit from that because I don't want my life and my thinking and my whole pattern of being to be so radically changed. I want religion. You know, I'll, I'll give it an hour or two a week. And just let me get on with the rest of my life, thank you. Let me think as I used to think. Just, yes, I have a religious conscience, and yes, I want to salve that conscience to some degree, but uh, just keep at arm's length from me. Yeah. That's why Judaism became so attractive to these Gentiles who had once believed in the grace of God in Jesus. And we've got to be careful that although we may not go and join the local synagogue, that we don't fall into the same mentality of mere religion, of going through certain rituals and paraphernalias and, and, and established habits of going to a church once or twice a week and yes, signing up to this, that or the other, so that I can just get on the rest of my life and live pretty well like the guy next door lives who doesn't believe. Yeah? That's our tendency, I think. So, he says, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Let's unpack that. He gave himself, himself. You think of Isaiah 53, God made his soul, the soul of the suffering servant of Jesus, made his soul an offering for sin. He poured out his soul unto death. He did not simply, you know, physically, sort of, mechanically give his blood and his body. He gave himself. And when you look at this bread and wine, I mean, you have here... Sure, the symbols of his body and his blood, but his blood, with utmost respect to the blood of the Lord, was red liquid, just like the blood that you and I have. His body, represented by the bread, was, well, the same stuff that you and I are made of. He was our representative of our nature. We are saved by him giving out of himself to us. What does this wine represent? It represents his blood, which represents his life. Yeah, it was his life that was given. His body, we break, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, in memory of how he broke his body, but not a bone of him was broken, we are told in John 19. That's why they didn't break his legs, or they broke the legs of the thieves. They didn't break his legs because not a bone of him was to be broken. So in what sense do we break this bread? Well, because the body that we remember, as I say, is not so much the flesh, the stuff that you and I are made of as well, but the breaking of his very self. That's the point. That's what we remember in, in this bread and wine. So then, he gave himself. And in 2 Corinthians 8, 
Paul talks about how the Macedonians gave themselves to the Lord Jesus. And you see, this is the power of understanding, his giving of his self to you and me. As he's going to say in chapter 2, verse 20, the Son of God loved me and gave him self, gave his soul, gave his self for me. And that elicits from me a giving, not of a couple of hours a week, not of mere religion, mere religious allegiance to him, but giving of myself to him, all that is in me, whole heart, soul, mind, strength, etc. It elicits it from us. So he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil world. If we remain in this world, or as was happening in Galatia, that these Christians were going back to the world, his death is in vain. Now, deliver there, it means literally to tear out, to pull out, to grab out. We have been grabbed out of this world by his death. How does that happen? How does the, the death on a cross, on a let's say, a, a stake of wood on a tree trunk, basically. How does the death of Jesus on a tree trunk on a Friday afternoon, on a day in April, 2000 or whatever years ago, on a hill just outside Jerusalem, how does that rip me out of this present world? Well, this is how. That if I know that he has died for me, that he there gave himself for me, then... How can I stay in the thinking of this world, this loveless world, this ungodly world, this evil world, as he calls it? No, I come out of that world. Of course, I stay in it to witness, to love, to show his love to them. But we cannot go to this world, back to this world, because he died for me. That is Paul's opening argument. You are going back to this world, be it the world of Judaism or whatever. It's still this present evil world. And yet Jesus died for you, for your sins, to pull you out of this world. Now, Paul is alluding, I think, to what the Lord Jesus had told him when he's converted. He's told that he would, Jesus would deliver you from the Jews and from the Gentiles to whom I send you. Same word. And here Paul says... And he died to deliver you as well as me from this present evil world. That's one of many points where you see Paul presenting his own conversion as a pattern to us, as he says in Timothy, as a pattern to all them who should hereafter believe. So he there, going one way to Damascus to kill, persecute, torture, murder Christians, was converted to the way of Jesus. And that is our pattern. It is not simply something to be marveled at historically, that a man called Saul of Tarsus was converted like that. This is our pattern. And remember, the Lord Jesus appeared in bright light, and he says to the Corinthians that the light of the glory of the Lord Jesus has shined in the darkness of our hearts. Again and again, he's alluding to his own conversion and putting that up as a pattern, as he says, a pattern for all them who should hereafter believe. So he is our a pattern that we might follow Jesus. So he goes on to lament that they were, verse 6, deserting the grace of Christ. And as I began by saying, yeah, you might say, well, how could you desert such a grace? Yeah, quite easily. Because if you really get it, that if you and I die this moment, or Jesus comes right at this moment, I will be saved by his grace. I shouldn't be, but I will be. Whoa, I've got eternity in front of me. My future is secured. Death is vanquished for me. We have, as John's Gospel often says, the eternal life. Sure, you can throw it away, but at this point, you have it. Well, that demands everything from me. And they were pulling back from the wonder of it all because it is so demanding. Not that he demands anything. That's the nature of grace. But because 
When you're in engagement with that grace, sure, this demands everything. This is no hobby. This is no mere religion. <clears throat> and he says very clearly how wrong this is. And he says that we have been delivered from this present evil world. And he rather likes this idea of present things. Because the idea is that which is immediate, that which is instant, that which is right now before my eyes, this present world, this reality that is in front of you, which is not the real reality. He uses the word in Romans 8 where he says that even things present, same word, this present evil world, things that are right in front of you shall not separate you from the love of, Christ, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He talks in 1 Corinthians 7 about this present distress, the situation that is right now in front of us. Now, in John's Gospel particularly, you have this idea of being given a new pair of eyes, of having spiritual vision, which sees things differently. You don't see so much this present world, this instant world, this world of impressions, this world of things that are right in front of my nose, as the ultimate dimension. You see with the eye of faith. You lose your job, you lose your husband, you lose your wife, you lose your kids, you lose your flat or, or whatever, and you think, oh, the end has come. And I know it's easier to say this, but that is this present world. That is just what is in front of you. There is this huge other dimension of the love of God for me through Jesus right now, his relationship with me now, and the wonderful eternity, eternal life that I will spend with him in the future. This is the true life. This is, as John ends his first letter, this is the true God and life eternal. This is the life. But it's invisible, unless you've got the eyes of faith. And this is where we so need, as he says, to anoint your eyes with eye salve, which is his spirit, so that you may have another pair of eyes, so that you might be like, the blind man whom he cured in his ministry, who suddenly see life. This is us, that we see another dimension, that life is more than what is right in front of me. That looks good, so I want it. Oh, that looks cool, I want that. Oh, that's awful, what I've got happening right in front of me. Oh, death itself is looming. Game over. No, game not over. Sure, we shall lie down and rest in, in the dust, but it will be but for a moment. And the next waking moment will be in this true dimension that the kingdom has come. So, <clears throat> he really labours the point as he goes through here, that look, I did not have any, any at all human qualification to do what I'm doing. It was all by direct outcome of my encounter with Jesus. He says, verse 11 and 12, the gospel that I preach is not from man. I didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught it by men. They're like, what college did you go to? What qualification? Did you go to Bible college? He said, no, no, I didn't. But I received it through direct revelation from Jesus Christ. And you've heard, he says, of how I was in the past, and, and how I was converted by Jesus. So he, he says in verse 10, I'm not trying to please men, but I am a servant of Christ. And if I were still pleasing men, I would not be the servant of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, yeah, I'm not out to impress. I'm out to tell you the ultimate truth, which is of Jesus Christ. And this idea of, I am not pleasing men, you meet this quite often in his writing, that we are not men pleasers. We may think, oh, well, I'm a strong individual, I don't care what people think about me. Well, most people do. That is how we are born, I'm afraid. It is the natural human tendency that we take our meaning from what other people think of me. Why do people like having flash cars or impressive houses, etc.? Well, because other people think that's cool. 
they themselves may say, oh, it means nothing to me. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. But what you're worried about is what other people think. I must keep up appearances. And we all have this very sharp tendency to perceive what other people would like me to say and how they would like me to appear to be. And then we want to go and say that and do that. We're all very sharp and quick and smart at doing that. So to be a pleaser of men is actually part and parcel of being human. But we have to realise that we are not here to please men, but to please Jesus. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, again, he uses these same words. He says that men do not please God, as they're living in sinful lives. And so he says, I preach not as pleasing men, but God. So he's saying that my whole structure of thought and approach to life is not to please you. It's not to say what you would like me to say, but to please God and to please Jesus. And he makes it specific into Timothy. You know, he talks about being a soldier, that we're soldiers. No soldier in service entangles himself in the affairs of this life so that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier so that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And that's God and the Lord Jesus. Now, many people, most people, live their lives, if they're really brutally honest about it, trying to please other people. You want to please your parents. This is natural. You get married, you get in a relationship, you want to please your partner. Yeah, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7. If you get married well, you will be living a life of pleasing your partner. And that will be your issue. Will he be okay with this? Will she be okay with that? Now, I'm not saying, so stuff everybody and just do what you want. No. I'm not arguing for insensitivity. You know, I don't care what you feel or I care about your opinion or your response to my behaviour. No. This, that would be chronic egoism. No selfishness. No, we're not talking about that. Sure, we should be sensitive to others and their feelings and their likely responses. I'm not saying we shouldn't be. Absolutely should be. But I am saying that we do not take our meaning as persons from the opinion of others. Because we are about pleasing Jesus. And people are so caught up with this trying to please others that they are totally not in touch with, their, with themselves, with their real self. It is all about doing what is seen to be okay in the eyes of others. What would the neighbours think? How many times have you heard that? What would the guys at work think? And in church life, it's just the same. If we fellowship with her, uh, what would the church down the road think? What would they think? And it's all sort of wrapped up and made respectable in this talk about unity. Oh, well, I, I'm like this because I'm very passionate about unity. No. Every nutter in the book has been on about unity. Babylonians were on about it. Hitler was on about it. National Socialism stands for national unity. On the other end of the political spectrum, Stalin was on about it here in this part of the world. For the Soviet Union, on about you know, Communist Party, the Soviet Union stands for national unity. Sure, every now and again, unfortunately, uh, very sadly, uh, you have to liquidate. You have to liquidate the people who might um, <clears throat> disturb that unity, the outliers, the people who don't fit in, the people who think otherwise. Yes, liquidate <clears throat> the kulaks. Liquidate this one. Liquidate this one and that one and the other, to, to keep unity. And it's all, it all develops into this idea of what would other people think? What would they think? And as I say, it's a fine line, and it's there, between genuine sensitivity and kindness to others, that is one thing, which must not be lost sight of, and not being an egotist, a total you know, my ego, it's all about me, and I shall do what I want, and I don't care what you think or how you shall respond. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we do not get our value from 
what other people think because we are not pleasing men. We are, if, how do you avoid this tendency that we have to please men, to say and do what we correctly perceive they would like me to say or to do? Well, you get out of that by being totally locked in to this personal relationship with Jesus. He chose me to be a soldier, so I'm only worried about pleasing him, not pleasing men. I shall not tell you what you would like to hear. I think that's what he's saying. And insofar as we have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, we are not serving public opinion or perceived public opinion, pleasing men. It's about him. And that relationship with him dominates and will always come out on top in all our decisions. Now, this is something I've seen in my own life, that as I grew in personal connection with Jesus, it's not that I can care less what you think, but I do not need your affirmation. You, know, you can imagine, you know, I am preaching, doing a lot of talks and stuff like that. I, yeah, I've got a full inbox, I can tell you. Oh, you're very wonderful. Thank you, Brother Duncan. Oh, you're wonderful. You helped me so much. Yeah, so you say. It doesn't add anything to me. And all the other stuff, oh, you're terrible. You're a heretic. How dare you? You're this, you're that, you're the other. So you say. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, it is a very small thing for me to be judged by you or anybody because there is one that judges me and that is the Lord Jesus. You can see he's saying the same thing as he's saying here. I'm connected with him. He is my Lord, my judge, and you are not. So what do you think of me? Uh, as he said, it means very little to me. If you don't like what I'm saying, say so you don't. If you love it, say so you do. That ain't good for you. Or whatever. You know? But Jesus was the same. When at the beginning of his ministry, oh, you're wonderful, Jesus. It says that he did not commit himself unto them because he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. And whether the crowds were shouting out for him, Hosanna, or whether they were shouting out, crucify him, crucify him, he was focused upon the Father. And that is the point. And so he goes on here. <clears throat> to talk about his earlier life, verse 13. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and destroyed it. And I've said that he presents his conversion as a pattern for us. And he very often uses this word for persecute, that I persecuted the church. And literally it means to chase, to follow after, to chase somebody, to, to follow after absolutely obsessively to follow after someone. That is what the Greek word for persecute means. But he uses it in another sense. For example, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, <clears throat> follow after, persecute, chase after, same word, love. Love for the church, love for people, love for your brothers and sisters. And again, Romans 14, follow after, persecute, Chase after, follow after, peace, and the things which edify or build up the church. So he says, I used to persecute, used to chase after the church to destroy it, and now I chase after love. Now I chase after building up the church. So you see what conversion was for him. Remembering what he says to Timothy, that his conversion is a pattern for everyone who shall hereafter believe. Robert Roberts puts it, he was, Paul was, a Christ-appointed model for each of us. So, there he was chasing after the church, persecuting it, and then that gets turned around. That chasing after becomes chasing after love for the church and building up the church, instead of chasing after destroying the church. So that is what the conversion process does. It radically changes you around. It reorients you. <clears throat> it does not per se destroy the essential you. It's a restructuring, if you like, a psychological restructuring. So the things you once ran after, now you run another way. But the essential you is there. I'll give you an example. Brother who is an invalid, who gets a very small disability pension, lives in a high-rise block of flats, doesn't have much money, he can't really work. He became an addict an addict 
to gaming. Yeah, you know, computer. He was just absolutely addicted. And he got this kind of buzz, he told me, when he got up to platinum level in this game or that game. Or, oh, I got the bullseye. Oh, I destroyed the tank in that game. Oh, I got 10,000 points. Very few people in that game ever got over 10,000. I did. You know. And he got this big buzz when he you know, did it. Now, he spends his life, on his internet life, on forums, chit-chatting with people about the gospel. And the buzz is when he gets somebody to accept some aspect of God's truth, and the big buzz is if he can get that person to get baptised, although he can't get out to baptise them, but he either gets them to baptise themselves or gets someone like me to go and baptise them. You see, that's a, a changeover. Well, you imagine, and you're a man in Christ, you imagine the guy who is a businessman, who has got some panache and some ability, and he's selling a certain product each time he's, he makes a deal, that's 5,000 basically for him. So he can't win every time, but he goes and meets this guy, yep, got it. Takes him out for a meal in a restaurant, got the deal, clinched the deal, yes. It goes on like that and feels, yes, I got it, yep. Another 5k. Yep, got it. Oh, didn't win that one, but ah. And now the guy doesn't do that. And he takes someone who's a loser, you know, or someone who's homeless or who's a, an asylum seeker or someone who is in some sense in their life a loser. He's an alcoholic, maybe. A drug addict. Takes them out for a coffee in a cheap cafe. Or a McDonald's or somewhere like that. And persuades them of Jesus, and takes them someplace and baptises them. That's it. Not for himself, but for the Lord. You see, that's conversion. That is conversion. The guy remains the same, is in the sense of his basic structure of personality, but it's all been reordered. And I think that's why Paul was such a zealous Christian, because he was a zealot anyway. He was actually a missionary for Judaism. Absolutely passionate about it. And that all got turned around. He became another kind of missionary for the Lord Jesus. And so that is what happens when we are converted. And you may say, well, <clears throat> I don't know if that happened to me. Well, this is, I admit, a big problem for those who were raised and schooled into Christ by good mums and dads who taught them the gospel. And I think those folks especially need to pray to the Lord Jesus and to pray to the Father to do this to them. Because none of us were okay, as it were, from birth. We had to be changed. Well, <clears throat> he says in verse 14, I was very zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I was zealous. Well, I think he's pretty well quoting there from the Septuagint of 1 Kings 19 verse 14, where Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord. And he quotes this about himself. And then what does Elijah do? He's like, I've been very zealous for the Lord, and nobody else is good enough. They're all fake, apart from me. What does he do? He goes to Mount Sinai, or to Horeb, as it's called in 1 Kings, and basically resigns his prophetic commission. He's disillusioned with the brotherhood, if you like. He thinks he's the only decent guy. And God's not pleased with him, basically. He, goes, he says, I'm very zealous. And then he goes to Horeb, or Sinai, and resigns, basically, his commission as a prophet. Paul is alluding to that. Because he says, I thought I was very zealous, but actually, he goes on, when I was uh, given the commission to go to the Gentiles, I didn't go to Jerusalem, but I went into Arabia. I went into Arabia. I went into Arabia. Well, Arabia is where Sinai was, or Horeb was, and if you want evidence of that, You've got it right in Galatians 4, where he says, one of the few references to uh, Arabia, 
that Sinai is in Arabia. That's in chapter 4 of Galatians, verse 25. And it, it can't be... Uh, it, it can't be incidental that you've just got that little bit of background information right here in, in Galatians. Hagar, he says, represents Mount Sinai in Arabia. And he says here in chapter 1, I was very zealous for the Lord, and then I went into Arabia. Seems for three years. Well, I think he's saying, look, I don't have any great qualification. Actually, I'm not even, I've not even been very faithful to the commission I was given. I was given a commission to preach to the Gentiles. And yeah, okay, he started off pretty keen, but he got disillusioned. He didn't get support from the uh, ecclesia, the church in Jerusalem. He goes to Arabia for three years. And the next, you know, he's back home in Tarsus, where he came from. And Barnabas, bless him, goes to Tarsus, we're told. He sought hard for Paul, Saul, and found him and brought him to Antioch to become a missionary. All the language of the lost sheep parable, that the lost sheep is sought for, found, brought home. The way it's described in Acts that Barnabas went to Tarsus, searched around for Saul, found him, brought him to Antioch. It's all out of the lost sheep parable. It's a wonderful application of that parable. To go to somebody who is lost because they've pushed off from their commission that God's given each of us and brings them back. So I think that's his point here. That, look, I was not the best. I for sure am absolutely and solely called, as he says, through his grace. And he says, verse 16, that this was to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I think he's saying that your public witness, his public witness, was a revelation of the Spirit of Christ within me. So therefore, preaching Jesus Christ is not simply a case of educating people theologically. Let me put you right on this point of doctrine. Let me teach you the Bible. Sure, I'm not saying it's not about that. But the essence is that we have been chosen to by God to reveal his Son within me. As Paul says himself, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If we receive the Spirit of Jesus, if we have his thinking within us, this then is what is revealed. To preach him among the Gentiles. So it's all, he's saying, look, no, you ask me for qualification, I don't have any Bible college, I don't have any bit of paper behind me no absolutely not do i get have i got a stamp of approval for some from some church or other no i don't but i have jesus within me and it is him that i have shown to you as he's going to say in chapter 3 verse 1 i placarded jesus christ crucified before your eyes you saw in me jesus crucified and he says verse 16 i did not confer with flesh and blood very odd word, confer, the Greek word that's translated confer. And it only occurs here and in chapter 2, verse 6 of Galatians, nowhere else. And it literally means to add to, or to have added to. I did not have anything added to me by men who are only flesh and blood. So what what they think? So what if I've got the approval of a church or not approval of a church? So what if I've got the okay from these people or not? They're only flesh and blood. It means nothing. So he says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. And I think the idea is, <clears throat> I did not have anything added to me by flesh and blood. I have the spirit of Jesus, and that is what I showed to you. That is the qualification. And in chapter 2, verse 6, he does a play a word play. He says, those who seemed something in conference added nothing to me. I said that the Greek word for conference means to add to. 
So I think he's meaning, those who seemed as if they could add something to me, added nothing to me. So what he's saying then is that I have had nothing added to me by anybody. It is my connection with Jesus personally, which is my total adequacy, and I do not need to be affirmed by men. Now, this is easier said than accepted. We all have this chronic need for acceptance by people. Somebody says they accept me. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. This is why people fall in love with all kind of crazy mismatched people. Because we are all little children. We're all little orphans, really. Looking for someone to love me. Looking for someone to accept me. Someone to tell me I'm great. That's what it is. Guy meets a girl who came out of the orphanage, tells her he loves her, and he's there for her, and buys her some flowers. That's it. Oh, I've got him. I've got somebody. Whoa. People fall in love easily because of that sort of thing. Because they're desperate for that affirmation, for someone to affirm me. And so they become vulnerable. People are vulnerable. Everybody is vulnerable. Those who look so self-assured and tough and all the rest of it. No, they're all vulnerable little children. That's who human beings are. Very vulnerable to other people telling me that they love me, telling me that they affirm me, telling me I'm pretty, telling me I'm handsome, telling me I'm wonderful, telling me that I'm okay. Oh, that's very important. And that's one reason why people's human relationships get so messed up. So messed up. Because we're all so vulnerable. And, oh, you tell me I'm great. Oh, that's great. You know? Oh, there's an argument in the family. Oh, the in-laws say that I'm a bad guy. I can't cope with this. I'm out. Or whatever goes on. You see, that is life under the sun. But... If you have this relationship, this personal relationship with Jesus, you are affirmed by him. You're not running around desperate for other people's affirmation, terribly hurt by slander. You know, people say, oh, she slandered me. And I'm, I was so hurt by that. You can't understand how hurt I was. Absolutely you were hurt. Absolutely you were hurt. But I'm afraid... I've been hurt by slander. Okay, so I'm not going to go at you. I've got at myself. Why was I hurt? Because I was not enough affirmed by my relationship with Jesus. He thinks you're wonderful. He thinks I'm wonderful because he loves us. And if you love somebody, you think they're great. He loves me. He thinks I'm great. Love is more than tolerance. That I'll put up with you, Duncan. He actually likes me, and he actually likes you. He counts us as if we are righteous, imputed righteousness. Read Romans 1 to 8. We who are sinners are counted as righteous. We are justified. We are loved. We are enthused over by him. Now, if you can feel that, oh, she slandered you. He, he slandered you. And they said this. Oh, did they really? Well, that's... So you say, that's so he did. I'm caught up with this relationship, thank you, with him. He thinks I'm great, he likes me, and I love him. Oh, and you, you, you run me down, so you did. Uh, so I'm back over here, guys, in this relationship with this wonderful man who loves me, who is not a fake, who is not doing this for appearance, who didn't just buy me some flowers to chat me up, make me feel good for a day. The real deal, who died for me, rose again, loves me cares for me at every nanosecond of my ex existence and has given me eternal life to be enjoyed in the future in his kingdom and forgiven me oh, so much and so patient with me and is concerned about me and is praying to the Father for me on his own agenda. Oh, oh, and, 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 and you, you said this about me. I say you did. Oh, sorry, don't, I'm with him. And so if you've got that, and this is how you feel Paul was here. Well, he's saying, you know, you're saying all these things about me. You're repeating gossip about me. You're asking me to justify myself, to give my qualifications, etc. And 
who authorised you and who are you anyway? <laughs> so what, you know, I've got him. And it's on the basis that he told me, for example, to go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptise people. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. People say to me, oh, I couldn't baptise someone. I was talking to someone the other day uh, who happens to live in the next village to where there's someone I'm corresponding with um, he wants to be baptised, and I said, oh, would you baptise them? Oh, oh no, oh, 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 oh. there'd be a lot of trouble in, the, uh, in their church, you know, because I'm, uh, no, no, couldn't do that. Um, uh, no, I, I'd need to have authorization from the church, and they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't give that. Uh, yeah, this is mere religion. I heard about authorization, I know it could cause upset and all this sort of thing. I mean, they might be upset, and it probably will be. But, and? Him. He's told you to do this. He is the one you're in relationship with. <laughs> what they think is what I think. Good for you. Yeah, so you say. That's my favourite little phrase, huh? so you say. So do my mind. People tell me, you, yeah, you're wonderful. People tell you you're awful. So you can't do this, or so you say. He is the one. He is the authority. Not you, not public opinion, not the opinion of those people over there, or what she thinks, so what. Now, I'm not saying, as I said at the start, to be insensitive to other people. But, unfortunately, public opinion and collective opinion, be it of individuals, family, a church or whatever, cannot mean anything compared to that relationship with Jesus. And if those people who are judging you are in Jesus and are, have the Spirit of Christ, don't worry, they will understand and, and they will not reject you. If they do reject you, they do not have the Spirit of Christ, without which you are none of his. As I say, our witness is on the basis that Christ is in me and I'm revealing him to you. That is the basis and that is where the true witness is unstoppable. It's not like, oh, could you go and preach over there? Well, you are a preacher. We are witnesses. We are all a light. Uh, of the world, we are all the cities set on a hill that cannot be hid. That is how you are as a person. We've all been told to go into the world and tell men and women and boys and girls the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection and to baptise people into his death and resurrection and then teach them all things that he commanded. We've all been given that. And it's as simple as that. And you, you need no authorization, no okay to do it. Or, 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 well, the committee's got to agree. You don't need any of that. If you've got him... If he's telling you, well, that's it, a word from the Lord is enough, absolutely enough. Let's say, it's not a case of being arrogant or being insensitive or unfeeling or uncaring. It is simply that the word from him and the relationship with him dwarfs any complaint like the Galatians are making. But Paul, you're not qualified. Paul, we're not satisfied with your qualification. So you, so you say. Uh, yeah, well, what does he do? He carries on anyway, but he begs them to have this same conversion experience that he had, where you are with the Lord, and he is with you. And instead of persecuting the churches, in his case, your whole energy, the whole structure of your being has been realigned and readjusted, and you are going persecuting, following, chasing after him and his ways. And the way of love. Well, we come to the Lord Jesus, who I suppose was the ultimately a strong individual, who was not swayed, ultimately, by his friends leaving him at the critical time, his three best friends, Peter, James and John, falling asleep in Gethsemane, but Peter denying him three times, Judas betraying him, being left misunderstood, Alone, humanly speaking, at the, at the end, and indeed through much of his life. Not swayed by the crowd saying, oh, you're wonderful, oh, crucify him. No. Not swayed by that. Not swayed by Pilate saying, uh, do you know who you're talking to? I have power to crucify you and I have power to release you. No. Not phased at all. Not phased at all. Because he was secure in his relationship with the Father. And this is the pattern for us, to be secure in that relationship. And how do you know you're secure? It's always the fear, unspoken fear, maybe, in all human relationships. 
that it might end. Certainly it's going to end in death. It might change. He might become different. She might get into a career and become a different woman. He might get more friendly with his mates at work. Or she might get too involved with her, I don't know, her mates at work or whatever. The fear of change, the fear of endings that there is in all human relationships. The fear of betrayal, that when you don't think it's going to happen, it happens. He leaves her. Oh, she's been having an affair for the last five years. Oops. Yeah? There is none of that with Jesus. None of that. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The rock that followed them. And that rock was or represented Christ, Paul says. The rock, just like his father, the rock of ages, not going anywhere. Absolutely solid. And it is that relationship that means everything. And it was sealed, as it were, by his very public death. God commended his love to us, as if it needed any commendation, but he did. He commended his love to us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Chapter 2, verse 20 here in Galatians, The Son of God loved me, and gave himself for me. Heavenly Father, we come to thank you for the stability of your love for your grace, for your passion for us through your Son. And we thank you that you will never, ever leave us, nor forsake us. And that you have loved us unto the end through your Son. We pray that we might be the more secure in your love, and that from that security we might reach out into this troubled world of failed human relationships and disappointment in human relationships, that we might reach out and bring other people also to know you and to have that same secure relationship with you and your son that we have. For his sake. Amen. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this cup of wine in which we see the communion of the blood of Christ, the ultimate symbol of his love for me, that he poured out his soul for me. His soul was made an offering for my sins. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will persuade us again of your total forgiveness of us, of your total acceptance of us. And we pray that we might not fall away from that grace, but that we might rejoice in it, and that we might live it and share it the more. For his sake.